all of your colleagues, students that are not able to join us today. Um, so I want to tell you just a quick introduction into um, why I asked these folks to join me today for this discussion. I've known Devin Reeves since 2014. And I uh, got connected to Devin through recovery high school advocacy work, along with just pretty much anything that's fighting for the rights of disenfranchised people, especially those with substance use disorder uh, that are looking to get uh, opportunities to build their recovery capital. And we know that education is a great equalizer, and Devin is a really great example of how education can really level the playing field for folks. And then Katie Bean, I've heard about for uh, quite a while now with her work uh, at St. Joseph's University, and I'm really excited to actually have somebody, as many of you, who wears multiple hats on a college campus, really tell us how she's weaved in recovery support advocacy throughout what she's doing. So what we're gonna do is, if I can figure out how to unmute Devin, because if you know Devin, it's really important to actually have him muted until it's his time to talk. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute Devin and turn it over to him for the first portion of our talk today. All right. Um, hello, everybody. It seems like it is poll time. It is. <laughs> I'm going to do a poll real quick. And Devin, I'm going to let you introduce yourself while the poll is in progress. So everybody that's participating, sure, so please take a second. So hi everybody, my name is Devin Reeves. Uh, I'm a person in long-term recovery. For me, that means that since August 21st, 2007, I haven't used uh, any drugs or alcohol. And I've been working in the substance use disorder field since 2008, um, working in all levels of treatment from recovery resident to marketing to a short stint as the executive director of a treatment center. And really for the last, five years I've been advocating for evidence-based interventions and just a better response to the opioid epidemic. Uh, and that really culminated a year ago, creating the Pennsylvania Harm Reduction Coalition, which is a coalition of syringe service programs, treatment providers, uh, parents groups to really change the landscape of the response to the opioid epidemic in Pennsylvania on the local, county, and state level. That's great, Devin. I'm gonna just jump in here real quick and just share the results of the poll. We had 90% that voted, and it looks like the most commonly used uh, advocacy polls right now are split equally, 33% 33% between special events and then guest lecturers to campus-wide events, followed by sharing students' stories on social media and print materials, and lastly, with one-page info sheets or white papers. And then I'll turn it back over to Devin. Sweet. All right. Uh, so this is just a little bit more about me. So, you know, what I want to say is if this is your first day on a webinar or you're really new to the recovery advocacy movement, I want you to I want you to know that it is a movement. You're not by yourself. There's lots of people that have been working on, you know, being the voice of people in recovery and advocating. And if you've never seen the anonymous people, that's a great documentary by uh, Greg Williams. <clears throat> Uh, for a while, it was on Netflix. I don't think it is anymore, but if you haven't seen it, go out and watch it immediately. You know, we have to understand our history. We have to know where we were coming from to understand where we're going. Next slide, please. All right. So this movement has had really big wins. You know, just in my home state of Pennsylvania, we were able to pass 9-1 Good Samaritan policies, uh, expanded access to naloxone. All 50 states now have expanded access to naloxone which is a life-saving medication, often known as Narcan. Uh, we've seen recovery advocates you know, fight and win for state funding slash authorization for collegiate recovery, per, uh, collegiate recovery programs. The 21st Century Cures Act, the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, these are all things that were helped in part by recovery advocates using their voice and using a lot of the same techniques that I'm gonna talk about today. Next slide. All right. So the most important thing when we're advocating for substance use disorder is we have to talk the right way. Uh, so we took this from the Faces and Voices Recovery Advocacy uh, training and uh, our, our, our stories have power. And this messaging was kind of vetted through focus groups, so on and so forth. I mean, this is not something that somebody made up and that thought it sounded good, but it really has its roots in a lot of social justice type of things. So, 
What we know about this messaging right off the bat is that it's person first. I'm a person in long-term recovery, which for me means that living in recovery has given me a new hope, new stability. I've been able to create a better life for myself, my family, and community. I'm speaking out so others have an opportunity to achieve long-term recovery as I have. And if you were talking about collegiate recovery to a dean or to a potential funder, you would just add that on the end. I'm speaking out so other college students have the opportunity to have what I have. Other people who have experienced incarceration can have the opportunities that I've had. And just as important as people who are in recovery using the right language, we wanna make sure our allies mirror that same exact language. So here's some core messaging for allies. And I think Katie Bean's gonna get into this a little bit more down the line, so I'm just gonna to touch on it briefly. Substance use just isn't an issue for the individual user. It also is a community health program that requires allies to be a core part of the change process. When united allies and those directly impacted by the harms of opioid crisis can work together to create long lasting change within the Keystone State. So this is an example from my state. It could be, you know, the Golden State. I don't know any other state's nicknames, uh, but you could tweak that to be your own thing. But this is the kind of messaging you want to use broadening the tent whenever possible. Next slide. So we are fighting an uphill battle. Uh, and the reason I really highlight the need to use that person first language or that message, that training, the language from that messaging is this is how the public sees us. And I understand that these pictures can be a little triggering for people and I apologize, but these are on the front page of newspapers all over our country. The middle picture is from the New York Times article uh, featured in Philadelphia, which was called uh, the Philadelphia called Philadelphia the Walmart of heroin. And you've got one gentleman who's actively shooting heroin. You've got another gentleman who is in a wheelchair and they're living under a bridge. It's very bad. It's very dingy. And they don't even bother to blur their faces. We don't know if they got permission. It really otherizes people with substance use disorder. The picture above that, we've got another person from Philadelphia under that same bridge. You see kind of like ramshackle tent living arrangements, just not doing well. In the bottom right was another salacious picture of a family that was experiencing an overdose with their toddler in the back seat. Uh, uh, the bottom left is somebody smoking uh, crack cocaine. And then the one I like least uh, out of all of these is kind of this headline, public health workers advocate for controversial strategies to keep opioids and other drug users healthy. You know, we were talking about treatment, I mean, housing first programs in this uh, um, event that this article is about. We were talking about uh, syringe service programs, uh, you know, evidence-based interventions that have been working in our country and around the world for 30 years, but the picture they chose was uh, pills? I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. So. We with substance use disorder, we formally diagnosed with substance use disorder, we in recovery, whatever makes sense for you, we as, we as people who advocate with pe for people with substance use disorder must keep this in the back of our mind. That when, when we're talking about our students, we're advocating for ourselves, the people we're across from, the desk from are thinking about pictures just like this. They're not thinking about the you know, 21 year old student who has had struggles with substances, is now in recovery and is ready to thrive. We need to reshape that and we really need to put that picture forward because it's hard to hate up close. And that's what we want to do. And that's why so I think so many of you selected, you know, sharing personal stories um, is a big part of what you do on campus. You int intuitively already know that. Next slide. So uh, a lot of times when I talk to students or therapists who are excited or on fire for collegiate recovery, you know, they say to me, Devin, you know, I'm just a student, I'm just a therapist, I'm, you know, I'm, it's only my first year here. Uh, I just want to say loud and clear that all of the collegiate, rec almost all of the collegiate recovery programs in the nation were started by people that were on the bottom rung. They were started by students. They were started by staff that didn't have tenure. They were started by people whose bosses said, that's a bad idea and you should stop talking, stop talking about it. Your voice has great power, and you need a megaphone to to really get that out there. And and I'm going to give you some of the tools, which could be your metaphorical me me uh, megaphone today. Next slide. All right. So I have done full day trainings on advocacy, half day trainings on advocacy. I could talk about it for a week straight. 
But when, you know, when Kristen asked me to do this training, I said, well, I'm going to try to get my best to get it down to, for 10 minutes, but um, here goes nothing. So action steps for change. First and foremost, you want to stay informed. You got to know what's going on. You got to be in the know so you can really see, be seen as a subject matter expert on your campus. So what I would say is you want to not follow her, but follow Transforming Youth Recovery uh, on all their social media platforms and make sure you're checking their website. You want to follow the Association of Recovery and Higher Education on all of their uh, outlets. You want to read the research. You want to get out there and read the research by Tom Kimball, Alexandra Laude. You want to make sure that you're familiar with the metrics because when you're advocating for this, you have to talk about data, retention rates, all the stuff that the higher ups really care about. And more than anything, if I could give you one piece of advice, make sure you make it to Boston next summer to attend the National Collegiate Recovery Conference. And now your school may or may not pay for that, but you wanna start having a plan for that now. I just went to the National Harm Reduction Conference in New Orleans about a month ago. I was raising funds to get myself there for six months. You gotta have a plan. You wanna start thinking about it now. It, it, it's really an affordable conference. Uh, and if you're not there, you're not taking the next step your collegiate recovery program needs. Uh, you want to make sure you do a needs assessment on not only your campus, but your community in general. You know, developing a collegiate recovery program at a place like Penn State, which is really in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, college town, is way different than developing a collegiate recovery program at some place like St. Joe's or even at a Drexel University, because these are both city schools. That means there's a ton of resources available for youth and young adults and returning students already in the community. There's already a ton of young people's meetings. There's already, already a lot of clinical resource, a lot of great therapists, outpatient programs. So without a needs assessment, you're not gonna know what your community needs and what changes you need to enact. And then you wanna, you know, you wanna take action, you wanna be proactive, right? This isn't a passive process. You wanna share content on social media. You wanna be emailing things that come in from the different um, you know, outlets that you're following, listservs, so on, and say, Hey, you know, Dean, I saw this. I just wanted to make sure it was on your attention. Ohio did this great thing around collegiate recovery. I thought you should know. You really want to be a consistent communicator when it comes to advocating for this. And you really want to spread the word and find allies. Nobody does this by themselves. Uh, so working with, you know, dozens of colleges across the country, what I could tell you is that people that I've seen that have been good allies in the past have included student council, Black Student Unions, Gay Straight Alliance, because a lot of colleges look at students with mental health concerns or substance use disorders as a marginalized population. And that's exactly what we are on college campuses. And these groups right here understand what it's like to be a marginalized population. And if correct outreach is done, there's an opportunity for collaboration and partnership. And I think that's really key to a successful collegiate recovery program. Next slide. And you really want to create a culture of advocacy, right? This can't be one person's mission. They can't be on this by themselves because it'll lead to burnout and resentment, and it'll be really, really tough. And I think there's three kinds of people that you've got to find if you want to have a successful culture of advocacy. First and foremost, you've got to find your emotional leaders. Uh, I used to call this uh, your hype man uh, or hype woman or hype person, but I think emotional leader sounds more adult, so that's what I'm trying to use this day, and this is the person that is fired up about recovery, they're fired up about collegiate recovery, they're fired up about making change, and when they go and talk to people, everybody can sense their excitement, and it's, it, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to deny that, and it's hard to not get sucked up into that energy. You wanna find your policy wonks, and these are the people that wanna read all the research, that wanna get into the bylaws of the university, that wanna look at budgets, these are the people that love numbers and reading and research. I am not that person. I try my best to keep up, uh, but you know that is, that is just not who I am to a core. And then you want to find your champions. You know, so much of this is about relationships, and nobody makes change by themselves. You know, if you want to go far, you got to go together, and that's why you have to find other people that you can sell your ideas to, get excited about your ideas, and really develop them into leaders that will also preach the good word on collegiate recovery. Next slide. All right, so I totally stole this from someplace else. I didn't invent it, but I really, really like it. Uh, this is really the next step of creating a culture of advocacy. Uh, and it's this kind of circular thing. You can jump in any place that you want, but I think the top one makes the most sense to me. You really wanna ask leaders who are willing to make a commitment. 
you know, without uh, students and faculty that are interested in collegiate recovery, collegiate recovery programs don't happen. And at no school is there all of a sudden a collegiate recovery coordinator that's getting paid full time to do that work. So that means you are, you know, in the counseling center, you're in the wellness center, you're in the, you know, maybe you're in the disciplinarian's office. Uh, and then on top of all the work, you're already getting overworked and underpaid. You are taking on collegiate recovery because you're passionate about it and believe in it. Uh, or you're a student who's already involved in a bunch of places, passionate about recovery, and you've got a lot of responsibilities, maybe working on your own recovery, being an active student, maybe you're part of other student groups. So you have to be really clear with people and say, hey, we want you to make a commitment. And you want to decide on what those goals are and what your potential challenges are right off the bat. You know, what am I making a commitment to? Uh, how much time is it going to take? What are our goals? What are some of the hurdles we're going to have to overcome? And you want to make a plan, right? We're going to do this many events this year. We're going to recruit this many students. We're going to find funding from this places. We're going to get te uh, technical assistance from brass tacks, what have you. You want to really make sure throughout this entire process, you're creating a space for comments and suggestions from the community. And that could be the broader community, other professionals, other students, because no change happens in a vacuum. And if you are, you know, a group of all men and you're not talking to women, you're going to miss it. It's going to be in your blind spot. Talk to people that don't look like you. Talk to people that aren't in the role like you and solicit their response because the more people that are really crowdsourcing this and you're engaging the hive mind to make change, the better and more sustainable the results will be. Next slide. It's all about people and relationships. If you forget everything that I've talked about today, I want you to know that relationships make everything happen. I met Katie Bean probably about four or five years ago because she was doing an event in the community. And I said, hey, I'd really love to participate. And that started, you know, several years of partnerships and collaborations. And there's been times where I've been really down about something. I've been able to call Katie B and she goes, we'll get through it together. You know, there have been people like Kristen Harper, who I've made a relationship with, who's helped me understand complex federal policies, introduced me to people on the federal and the state level. And, and without her, I wouldn't have all the success I've had today. And I've had endless champions in so many of my advocacy efforts. And without them, again, I just wouldn't have the lasting impact or the policies that I've advocated for haven't, wouldn't have the lasting impact. So, you know, I encourage you to find your own group of Avengers, your own group of superheroes that on their own are amazing enough to sustain their own blockbuster summer movie, but together they're unstoppable for change. Thanks for listening to me. and I'm going to pass it over to Katie Bean. Oh, I forgot. I got one more thing. So, like I said, there is uh, just so much to cover. Here are some great resources that I found on the web. The bottom two are videos that Brass Tax did on youth leadership and youth recovery. Uh, the top two are PDFs, so something that you could read. Uh, a guide to youth recruitment for youth move, which I think is really important because there's no collegiate recovery program without students. And another one is youth advocating for youth. All these are really awesome. I've read them over. I was involved with developing some of them. Uh, so yeah, check those out, and I think you will be well on your way to becoming a future advocate. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. Good job. This is Kristen Harper. I just wanted to just say for the record um, that if we get the opportunity to put together an Avengers, I would really like to be Iron Man. So I just think he's the bomb and has a really cool suit. 100%. As long <laughs> as I can be the Hulk. Of course. <laughs> I couldn't imagine using anything else. So we're going to do another poll while we transition over to Katie Bean, and I am actually going to post one about students. So you guys take a second to fill that out. And, you know, I really love what Devin talked about, about building those relationships and thinking outside the box. I think that that has been, um, for all the successful collegiate recovery communities that have developed into programs, that has been the one area that runs um, uh, all, throughout every single one. So um, I am really excited to have you guys uh, hear from Katie about what they've done at St. Joseph. Um, oh, Katie, would you mind turning on? There you go. Perfect. Um, especially when it comes to allies. So you guys go ahead and fill out that poll and we'll go ahead and let Katie introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm excited to be here. and. Uh, I am 
been working at St. Joseph's University since uh, 2011, before that at George Washington University. Um, and, you know, before that, I was a college student myself and a grad student myself working as a peer educator on alcohol and drug issues. So I actually started in college and never left. Um, I love the college environment. It's a great place where students can really figure out what they want to do with their lives. And we get to see immense change happen for them. Um, and so I think that is amazing. Um, I don't know that are the slides going to be up, Kristen? Oh, know. I'm sorry. They are up. Yeah, let me see. Oh, I cannot oh. see them. Yeah, let me close the poll. Hang on just a second. Okay, thank you. Closing poll. And I can just go ahead and touch base real quick on the answers to the poll. Um, so we've got the, apparently students are extremely interested, shocker, uh, about 45% of you guys responded that you uh, do have students that are interested. And you have some moderately interested, but you don't know how to provide the training, and then not at all, they want to remain anonymous is at 14%. And then we also have a 14% of you are getting uh, instruction from your students. So it's a pretty good mix. All right, Miss Katie, go right ahead. Awesome, thank you. Um, so a lot of what Devin said really makes a lot of sense to me um, as an ally, as someone who is not in recovery myself, but I'm, as Dr. Uh, Kimball would say, I'm a muggle in a wizarding world. Um, I, as an ally, have been trying to incorporate all of uh, all of the health and wellness work that I do with the recovery world and merging them. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk about today is what I've done on our campus and how Devin actually has helped me do it. Um, so if you wanna to go to the next slide. I'll start by talking about um, our collegiate recovery program known as the Flock Allies of Recovery. Um, on our campus, what we found works for us is combining the two groups, the students in recovery and the students who are, who are allies, who have a loved one or someone that they care about dealing, uh, who in recovery or dealing with a substance use disorder. And for us, that's the way that works. Not that doesn't work on every campus, but that works for us. Um, and I think what is really powerful about that is kind of to what Devin was saying, is that we need allies to be a part of this movement um, because together is where real change will happen. And so it's really important to include them. So what I'm going to talk about um, is a little bit first about how we'll build connections and how we build Recovery IQ on campus, how that helps us build more connections and more Recovery IQ. And I see this as an upward spiral um, that just continues to grow and grow and grow. Um, and one other thought earlier, Devin was saying that, um, you know, this is the work that we're doing for most people on a college campus is just one bullet in the job description that is quite long. Um, and to to reiterate that point, you know, when we started this work on our campus, this was not in my job description at all. Of course, I'm working with alcohol and drug education and with wellness. And so that's implied that I'm working with our students in recovery as well. But to the extent that we're working with our students in recovery, um, you know, it was not at all. So what I did was I actually advocated to add a bullet in, in my job description. Um, and that was able to happen a couple of years ago. So now that recovery is actually identified um, in my job description, if I ever leave, then that stays and that helps make it sustainable. So that's one small tip if you are doing this work um, to try to advocate for that on your campus. But let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about building connections. So some of the first kind of to-do items um, that I would see is reaching out to local advocates like Devin. Devin's the first um, advocate that I met in the area when I was getting into this work. And he helped introduce me to lots of other people, to reputable treatment centers in the area, to nonprofit organizations, to other people trying to do this work. And I think that's a really, um, really important connection is the other local advocates in the area. Um, I think, you know, YPR, we're really lucky that in Philadelphia we have a great YPR, Young People in Recovery chapter. Um, wherever you are, look for them because that's a really great nonprofit, great organization. Um, and reaching out to other colleges who might or might not have a collegiate recovery program currently is really important because, you know, if they don't have a collegiate recovery program, then for one, you can collaborate. You can try to get the few students that you both might have at the time to come together and provide social support for them. Um, and you can bounce ideas off each other, uh, maybe share funding, whatever you can do. So, of course, if they have a program already, you can learn from them. But even if they don't have a program, that's a really great resource as well. And recovery high schools that you might have in the area if you're lucky enough to have one. Um, academic departments on campus, there's a lot on campus that people forget about. Um, 
faculty often are forgot about, unfortunately, from the student affairs side of things. So reaching out to the obvious psych department, sociology, health, education, they're kind of the obvious ones to start with first and reach out to see, look on their websites and what research their faculty are doing. You'll find faculty are doing research that relates to what you're doing. And so you can um, kind of reach out to them and share your interest and see how you can collaborate. And of course, you'll end up finding faculty who are in recovery themselves or personally impacted um, and have a passion for it themselves as well. So that can be a really great resource. Um, and then student organizations that already exist on campus, many have a mental health mission. So Devin mentioned a few that are considered marginalized groups on campus, which is a great place to collaborate with, of course, um, but also reaching out to groups like Active Minds or other organizations that might have um, a mental health mission or focus. And then something that works well for us, you know, have those open general meetings where you're inviting all students, you're reaching out to the campus, not just trying to find students in recovery or their allies, but truly everyone and asking for their ideas, always with food, as we know. Um, but when you do that, we found a lot of things that people across the board wanted. Um, social activities are what everybody wants, you know, so we were able to uh, figure out basically um, different things that they wanted to do. And some of the things we have done, uh, one of the most popular actually is yoga for recovery. Um, so, you know, I'm actually trained through Transformation Yoga Project as a yoga teacher, and we can bring yoga for recovery to campus. They can, you can also work through that nonprofit and bring teachers to campus, and they have a, a trauma centered yoga practice, um, which is really a, a cool thing. Um, next slide, please. So as you're talking and reaching out to these different constituents on campus, it's really important to not just share what you want to share, but share what they need to hear. So it's important to think about where they're coming from and what they what's going to motivate them to want to help or get involved with with your movement. Um, and so, of course, as I mentioned, faculty, they care the most about research. So coming to them, sharing data right off the bat is really important and talking to them about students academic success. Um, and how being in recovery, students are more likely to thrive uh, academically. You know, you can share some of the research from Dr. Kimball that shows that from their Texas Tech, uh, from their collegiate recovery program. Um, and I really think, you know, focusing on academics and research, that, that's the language that they want to talk about. Within student affairs, every um, department outside of academic affairs, it's all about character development students developing as a whole, leadership development, communication skills, all of those things that create a whole person, um, health and wellness, um, all of that is what student affairs want to hear. And then you can break that down to different departments. Some are pretty obvious, like residence life. Um, they care all about building community and forming relationships. So when you talk to residence life, that's the angle that you should be using. Um, when you think about alumni, it's what affiliations do people have? Um, and how having a student organization for students in recovery, that affiliation, they kind of get tagged. And as alum, they'll be reached out to as remember your time with the flock, and then they're more likely to give. So that engagement as an alumni is really important. So when you reach out to them, you can talk about how you can kind of tag them and affiliate them for future donors, which is important to alumni. Um, and administration, of course, retention and revenue is what they want to talk about. So having that data that ARHE provides or other um, resources provide is really important to show when you're talking with uh, administration. Now, if you don't have certain data, like, of course, you can use the national data. If you don't have data for your own campus, it's one thing to start trying to gather and collect. Um, you know, if you're not doing the core survey or the Acha Nacha survey, if you don't know what those are, those are alcohol and drug surveys for your campus. If you don't have funding or you're not able to do those, there are other surveys that your school likely does that has alcohol or drug questions on it. So the SERP survey and the Nessie survey are two that come right to mind um, for freshmen and for seniors. And they're incoming and outgoing surveys that most most colleges participate in. And even though the, the survey has 200 questions, there's like five about alcohol and drug use. So we, you can even pull from those if you don't have any other data to start with. And of course, start collecting your own data. OK, next slide. <laughs> I could talk about this for days, so I'm glad I have to keep it short as well, like Devin said. So moving on to building connections uh, within everything that already exists. So this is something 
where I wanted to talk about where we've we've started to try to bring recovery language and recovery conversations into the already existing uh, places. One great example of this is uh, we created this workshop called To Tell or Not to Tell. And this is where we talk about um, how future employers might notice someone's identity on their resume on paper or in an interview through um, their different leadership experiences. For example, if a student says, I'm the president of the flock, Allies for Recovery on St. Joe's campus, here's my leadership skills. Is that something they want to share? Because then that's going, going to imply that they're in recovery. Do they want to out themselves at the res resume time, at interview time, or once hired? What, what does that look like for them? So we have this great workshop. We've ran it a few times. And um, it's been really interesting conversations that have come out of it because, of course, every person is different and they have a different answer to these questions. You know, some people are loud and proud and want to have that on their resume and others kind of want to wait till later. And we talk about how they can approach those conversations. Um, so that's been a really interesting place to bring conversations into the Career Development Center. The other one is our recovery abroad information. So we created a bunch of content for our students preparing to study abroad, questions to ask yourself when you're considering it, um, resources if you are abroad, and we were able to create that into uh, paper material, but also online material, um, and we have it on our and also the Study Abroad Office website. So again, these are just tiny ways to make sure that if a student is looking at all different resources on campus, they're seeing this language and it's becoming more a part of every day. Um, resources for veterans, coaches, parents. We also have that on our website. Um, the same information, just with different language and worded to that audience. Um, so that's another recommendation in order to help build connections. When you put it out there, when you put materials or web materials um, out there for people to find, they will find it and they will reach out to you. Um, so I think that's really important to just, you know, talk about recovery everywhere you're going, as Devin said, um, but also, um, putting it out into what already exists. So one example I wanted to share is uh, we were connecting with our local recovery high school in the area and we started a school supply drive to gather notebooks or whatever they might need for the academic year. As we were promoting that we were doing a school supply drive for the recovery high school in the area, we found a, a person who remains anonymous on our campus who really wanted to support uh, because that person was in recovery. And so what they did was they created 500 personalized printed notebooks for students at that school with this is their uh, logo for their recovery high school and it's personalized for them for their school he said uh, he didn't want to buy them just five cent notebooks he wanted them to feel special so that was just a great connection it was somebody who has nothing to do with any of the departments I've already mentioned, um, but this person was super interested when he saw that school supply drive. So it's a small thing that ends up finding a great other ally on our campus who can help support this. <clears throat> so next slide. I wanna start talking about Recovery IQ because it's one thing to build the relationships, which is really important, but the next part is to make sure that um, people are understanding what recovery is all about and increasing their recovery IQ. Now, this is a term that Devin has taught me, recovery IQ, and this really, to me, means building up people's understanding, education, but also empathy for people in recovery or needing recovery. And I see this through what American Cancer Society puts on their page. Uh, this is a link from their webpage about being a caregiver, being an ally to someone who has cancer. And the way I see this is, you know, I had someone tell me once they just wished that substance use disorder was a casserole disease, meaning when people are dealing with it, people will show up to your house and bring a dinner, bring a casserole and say, how can I help? And how's, how's treatment going? That's how people with cancer are treated. You know, people make them dinner and ask, how's your treatment going? Is there anything I can do for you? Let me pick up your dry cleaning and bring it over so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and that's what we need to do for people dealing with substance use disorder. And so I like to talk about it in the same way. On our website, we created Allies for Recovery and all of the same information that they have here, we kind of dubbed for there. So things like how to talk to someone who has cancer, which is on that page. So how to talk to someone um, who has a substance use disorder or someone in recovery. Um, you know, of course the language is super important as Devin was saying, but it's also about 
um, ways to how p different people deal with a diagnosis and their response to it and how all of it is normal. Um, how to know your own limits as a caregiver and a helper and an ally and to know when to ask for help. So all of these things I think are super important to bring allies in. Um, and this is just kind of our, our way of looking at it. <clears throat> um, next slide. So how do we build recovery IQ on our campus? One of the biggest ways has been through our allies of recovery training. Now I'm happy to share all of our content, the pre and post test, um, the slides that we use. I'm happy to share that with anyone on the webinar that wants it. Um, basically it's a two hour program. It's a two hour training. And we really look at trying to build skills and confidence in the in the participants. So not just gaining knowledge through the through the training, but also guilt, building their their confidence, their comfort level with talking about uh, these issues or intervening with a friend or um, caring for a loved one. Um, so supporting those in recovery through words, actions and advocacy. That's that's our tagline. That's kind of the, the whole purpose of the event or of the training. Um, and we do talk about everything from society stigma, why that's there, how that's been there, how it's changing, how we hope it to change. Uh, proper use of first person inclusive language, of course, is critical. Uh, warning signs, various causes, treatment options, many pathways to recovery um, and resources on our campus and in the area for substance use disorder. One of the things that we found through um, hosting this training on campus is that we have, um, you know, we do a pre-test and a post-test and we found like all of our data shows, our post-test rates, uh, they have an increased confidence in recognizing warning signs of a loved one, uh, of recognizing warning signs of relapse, um, an increase in comfort level if, with talking about these issues, an increase of knowledge about treatment options in the area. So all of these are phenomenal things. Um, but I wanted to share one specific comment that someone said in their post-test when we asked, how has this changed you? Uh, someone said, quote, a member of my family is in recovery, and I think I now have a better understanding of the challenges that he faces every day to maintain his sobriety. And I just think that's so powerful. Um, and there was one other I'd like to share. Quote, I want to host a party without alcohol for a friend of mine that is in recovery so they can feel supported while hanging out with all of our friends. Brilliant, brilliant. If we can do that for everyone, that would be amazing. Um, so this training we get out through going to department meetings. We have focused on staff for the first year. Um, we've trained over 100 people at this point, faculty, staff, and students. Um, and really we're trying to now target individual departments and individual student organizations to try to bring it to them, as well as we host it um, as like a campus-wide event as well. Uh, next slide. So the last thing I wanna mention is um, utilizing, to build Recovery IQ, utilizing professional development opportunities. Um, so on our campus we have, and I'm sure your campus has something similar, we, we call it the Teaching and Learning Forum, um, but it's basically for faculty and staff. It's, you know, once a year, it's a little like retreat or conference that we host on campus. So that already exists and we just plug in a lot of our content um, into that forum. So it's, again, finding what's already out there. Um, we, of course, try to have tons of informal conversations during we go to department meetings, staff meetings. Um, if, if someone will give me five minutes to come and talk to their staff meeting, I'll take it. Of course, I always ask for the two hour allies training, um, but if they give me 10 minutes, I'll do that as well. So we just try to get people talking and, and understanding what recovery is for their for students on campus. Um, and we invite off campus trainings to host on our campus. So when you do that, you give the opportunity for your faculty and staff to increase their own professional development in an easy way. Like this Friday, we are hosting, um, Karen Foundation is coming and hosting a training on how to support young people who have substance use disorder in the family. And so that's an awesome training um, right here on campus that we're allowing our, our professionals to go to. And last but certainly not least, I wanted to talk for just a moment about this Marginalized to Empowered Conference which is again a brainchild of Devin. Um, so he called me up and he said, I have this great idea. We need to get all these people together, faculty and staff who don't know that they need to know about these issues. And I'm like, I'm in, let's do it. Um, so we started with the first year and I think this last year, it was our third year of the conference. We had reached regional people, not just in this little area, but much further. 
Um, and it's really grown and it's providing an opportunity on our own campus. And so anyone can do that. You can start by getting a couple of people together and hosting an hour training and then seeing where that goes. If that can turn into a conference, awesome. Um, but any kind of professional development is always useful for faculty and staff on your campus. Uh, next slide. I think that was my last slide, actually. Yeah, so that was just uh, scratching the surface, I would say, for advocacy on campus. And we have tons of time for questions, but I see another poll is coming up. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie. I really appreciate it. I, you know, we're gonna do this quick poll, but then we are gonna open it up for more questions uh, from our participants. So you guys take a second to answer this poll. What resources would be helpful to, not your and your, to you and your program? Uh, advocacy toolkit, more one-on-one -on -one consultation with recovery advocates, training for students by students, leadership development for staff and students. Um, and I think that the allies piece is a really great bridge way to talk about how we could package some more of these uh, various conversations that we're learning are effective with different populations into maybe a toolkit or additional training, either virtually or in person. So it looks like we're getting some votes in and the majority of folks are asking for the advocacy toolkit um, and also uh, some advocacy training for students by students, which I think is really uh, an interesting idea. And ARET has started to lay the groundwork with their SAFE, their collaborative project with the SAFE project. Uh, so I hope everybody has gotten information on that. So that's pretty much everybody. I'm gonna close the poll now and put all of the panelists on camera together. And so people can feel free to um, ask questions. We've got a couple here. Devin, I'm gonna unmute you. And I'm also gonna put my webcam back on. So one of the questions we had was about suggestions for screening tools. And um, I'm not sure if that meant screening tools. Uh, I think it was for data collection. So did you develop the screening tools, especially for the training that you've done, Katie, or did you find other screening tools that are out there to assess kind of where people are pre and post? Um, for the pre and post for the allies training, it's something we just created ourselves. Um, so we utilized, we have, you know, a campus lab system that we use for surveying. Um, and it's actually a paper pre and post that they do in the, well, they do the pre in the moment. And the post we emailed them um, actually like a month after the training because we want to see if they've if their behavior has changed. Some of the questions are like, what have you done differently in the past month since the training? So we didn't want to just do the post test right in the moment, but we wanted to see actual change. Um, so that we just created ourselves. I'm happy to share. But that also means I don't have, um, you know, proven efficacy of, of the pre and post assessment, of course. <laughs> oh, can I share one more thing about the training that I meant to? Absolutely. When people go through the training, one of the biggest parts is that they get a button. Where's my webcam? They get a button, they get a table tent for their office, and they get a sticker for their laptop or their water bottle that says that they're an ally of recovery. And why is this so important? Because we need it to be blanketed across campus, right? We need to make it so clear that a student walks in just like Safe Zone um, has been on college campuses for many, many years. You have Safe Zone stickers, you know, on every door, and you know that it's safe because this person understands and is an ally for LGBT people on campus, same thing. So I would highly recommend making it as visible as possible. That's wonderful. And we have another question, and Devin, this one is probably uh, for you, but Katie, feel free to jump in there. What is the number one barrier that you feel like you have to overcome as a recovery advocate? Lack of understanding. You know, the biggest problem we have to overcome is the lack of understanding of what substance use disorder is. So many people look at substance use disorder or people with substance use disorder as really some kind of moral failing. Uh, you know, they'll say, I understand it's a disease, but when somebody has a reoccurrence of use, I just want to bang my head off the wall. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I understand that you care deeply and it, and it hurts when somebody has a reoccurrence of use. And by no means is everybody who has a substance use disorder, do they have a reoccurrence of use? But when it does happen, that's okay. And it's not something to be angry about. And uh, and really the other kind of side of that is explaining to whether it's professors or legislators that people in recovery aren't a liability, they're an asset. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
people are like, oh, do, we don't want those people on our campus. We don't want those people in our pharmacy or those people in our store or working, you know, with our children. I mean, people in recovery are great employees. And I know because I've, you know, worked for them and I've been an employee. You know, we've got something to prove to ourselves in the whole world. And we're going to work really hard to succeed. I would just add to, I would just add to that too that uh, sometimes what's hard for me is trying to get back down to baseline to have people like David said this basic understanding. So sometimes I get real excited and I get to talk to someone high up and and we're having this meeting and I'm 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 up here and they're like wait a second like what do you mean we don't say addiction I'm like oh man we got to start way down here again. Yeah. <laughs> But it, it's like putting myself back down to like, okay, we're, we're at like baseline understanding. We're trying to just get people at a very low level to understand what we're talking about. So that's a barrier, I think. That's a really great point. It also, it reminds me of a conversation. We were actually in your awesome state this week for recovery research collaboration at Penn State. And they're trying to, these fantastic, brilliant people are trying to put together new parameters for defining recovery, which I think is really exciting. And one of the things that I was really curious about is using whatever those findings are through research to help make an argument for collegiate recovery to be part of the fabric of our university, especially within the strategic plan, within budgeting. So what have you guys found to be most beneficial when you are working specifically with college administrators to get the buy-in to put them in the fabric? Hmm. I mean, you know, my experience with any advocacy is you want to have really peers advocating for each other. So if you're working up the food chain and you're running into a dean of students who's giving you a hard time, well, then bring in another dean of students that's out of school that this is going awesome and, you know, get them to talk to them. Um, mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to ask the big guns in the movement for help. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, you know, I've had you know, people from Rutgers here in Philly. I've had people from Texas Tech here in Philly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot. It doesn't matter where you are. There's somebody that's within a couple hours that would be, you know, for a, a $150 hotel room and some gas money would be happy to take a trip to your town to come and talk about collegiate recovery. And the number one prerequisite for any expert when it comes to colleges is that somebody flew here and they're not from here. That makes it seem serious to people like, oh, we flew him in. It, or her in, it's a big deal, you know? Uh, so those would be the two big pieces of advice I'd have for you. I would add too that on college campuses, maybe surprisingly, students have more power than almost anyone. Mm. And when you can get students to rally and sign a petition and through their student governance, they, you know, t like just today we had, you know, an issue come up within our student newspaper and they had this petition going. Well, now they get to sit down with the dean. Like, wow, you know, I don't I don't get his time. <laughs> you know, when you think about it like that, students really have power. Um, they're the people that run college campuses. So if you can get a, and the hard part is, at least for us, our collegiate recovery, our group is small. Like it's a small group. And we have some students who are in recovery that aren't out about it. And so our group is our group is small. So how do we get everyone to rally behind it, build that recovery IQ, and get every ally to think of this as an issue that matters to them? Thank you, Ben. From a radical perspective, you know, students can say things staff can't. You totally. Know, uh, <laughs> you know, Katie Bean or and outsiders can say things that staff can't. You know, there's been plenty of times on college campuses where I'm like, your policies are literally killing students. You know, there was a local university here in Philadelphia that has zero tolerance policy for students who use drugs. And I just kept harassing them, you know, <laughs> telling the newspaper about it. You know, we're in the midst of an opioid epidemic and they're setting up an environment where students are afraid to get their friend help because they're afraid that their student, may, their friend may get kicked out of college. That's a really, really dangerous thing, you know. Um, but if I worked at the university and was worried about my job security, maybe I wouldn't say that because. I have to put food on the table for my family. So it's, you know, finding other people to be your champion uh, that can say the things you can't say is also really important. And if you can find alumni who are donors, mm -hmm. then they have a lot of power. <laughs> mm -hmm. So while we're building that the research base for uh, what we know is working, while we're building that, then I think the relationship building is kind of where everybody is landed to really use those relationships as supportive um, to help raise the resources for these programs. 
We have a really great question that just came in from North Carolina from our friend Marbeth Holmes. Uh, she asks, she states first, <coughs> we offer safe zone for LGBTQI, green zone for military, and recovery zone, but still are seeking advocacy tools to help sustain energy and passion rather than having participants simply checking a box for professional development training. How do we sustain that interest? Mm. You know, that's tough, but can I, mean, I jump in, Devin? Sorry. That's that's a tough one, of course, because, um, you know, I we get a lot of students who do our training through a class. You know, they're taking, you know, a certain class that this is, you know, extra bonus points or whatever credit to, to get this additional thing. And so, you know, we'll get them to do it, but then how do we maintain that? That's something we've been obviously struggling with as well. And I think part of it is getting this personal storytelling because if, if they're not personally impacted, then that's one of the reasons they're checking out because maybe they think they don't know someone, although everybody knows someone. Um, so maybe they think they don't know someone. So sharing personal stories, I think is really powerful. Getting students to do more storytelling if they're willing and able and, and ready to do that. Um, even as allies, getting allies to tell that story. Um, but all that personal storytelling really, I think hits people's hearts more and um, keeps them invested. So that's just one idea. Devin? Yeah, yeah, so what I would say is, you know, that emotional leadership piece is not easy. And a lot of people care about this almost to their detriment, right? People feel like recovery saved their life, changed their lives, and they want to put everything into it, often that's a sacrifice of other things. So one, we have to work on teaching people we're working with balance mm -hmm. and, you know, self-care first and foremost, because I've seen too many great leaders burn out and in, in a really a, doing brilliant work and then it all falling apart because they weren't focusing on self-care. Second mm -hmm. is, you know, making sure that advocacy is fun and that we celebrate the small win. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we do a successful visit to a legislator, let's go out and get a piece of pizza afterwards. You know, let's find time to do social things and build that community within the program. Because it's, you know, for somebody like me, it's easy to become obsessed with change. And if I'm not having a good time remembering that I'm connected to other people, I can really become quite a Grinch. Uh, and lastly, recognize that after big events, there's going to be a re new energy and new excitement and really, really cat catapulting on that. So, you know, after the big uh, Young People Recovery Conference every year, you see chapters across the country are fired up and doing all kinds of big stuff. Uh, after the Collegiate Recovery Conference, people are fired up doing big things. So recognize when that time is on your campus and say, we're going to have a strategic planning session after this, or we're going to have this big event after this, and mm -hmm. building on momentum of event and event and event. You know, those, those are some small things that come to mind. That's a great suggestion, Alden. Thank you. I think we have time for this last question, uh, which is also a really good one. And this is kind of getting into a little bit of state advocacy and where the crossover is with collegiate recovery and for collegiate recovery. Uh, Chris Bowman asks uh, or says, we got some state funding for our CRP. Where or how would you prioritize what areas that money should be used for? Example, like marketing, website, outreach, employment. Ooh. I think <laughs> um, that that is a tough question because every school is going to be different. So on that campus, I can't speak for what is going to be best. I could just say what we did on our campus when we received funding. Um, here, what we did was we focused on getting drumming up student interest. Um, and so that was through a lot of events, um, whether that was a lot of it was social events, to be honest. So we worked with YPR. We tried to get students to go to that like midnight showing of Star Wars when that came out. We tried to get students to do, you know, the recovery walk and the uh, recovery at the ballpark, the Phillies game that happens. So we really tried to just have like pizza on Friday nights before our AA meeting on campus, just real social things because we wanted to get them excited, kind of to Devin's point earlier. And we also really focused on materials. So we purchased brochures that we made. We spent time getting things like this made um, because that stuff is sustainable over time. Um, and that's where we were using it to then build more connections. So those were two of the first things we did. I don't know if Devin, you have other ideas. Well, you know, one thing I would think about when you get funding is making sure that you can show results for the money you got. Working mm -hmm. with politicians, I could tell you that 
if they give you something, they want proof that it worked mm-hmm. well. And they want to be able to tout your success as their success. So whatever you spend the money on, make sure it's something that can be measurable on the back end. We had this many events, this many people attended the events. This was mm-hmm. the impact of those events. And there's lots of things that are you really need to do on your campus that aren't easy to measure, that you know mm-hmm. aren't really quantifiable, but are the important next best thing. You may need to find other money to do that because politicians want to know year after year, why am I giving you this money? And mm-hmm. what did this money do? Uh, because if you want to know somebody's priorities, look at their budget. You know, I mm-hmm. spend most of my money on, you know, food and my house and my baby, you know, that's where the money goes. Cause those are things that matter to me. I got to eat, got to have a roof over my head, got to make sure the little one is walking and crawling and stuff, you know, uh, same thing with politicians. If they're passionate about LGBT rights, that's where their budget's going to go. If they're passionate about grade school, that's where the money's going to go. If they're passionate about, you know, maybe more regressive policies, that's where their money's going to go. But don't make a politician look bad when they give you money and don't give them a good answer when somebody who disagrees with them or has a competing interest comes at them, they want to have good answers and you want to give them that good answers if you want to keep getting that money year after year. Mm -hmm. And one other thought with sustainability is one other thing I forgot we did was we created a video. So we paid for marketing uh, communications on our on our campus to create like a it was a video we showed at orientation to all incoming freshmen. It was another way to be sustainable to try to recruit. Um, But it was, you know, students talking about the flock, what it is, what the resources are on campus. And it was students in the video. So I thought that was a really good use, because then again, to Devin's point, you could show that video. and that can be, you know, something tangible. Absolutely. All really great suggestions. Well, that is actually all the questions that we have. Um, I just want to do a quick plug for the next webinar, which will be December 6th at 2 p.m. Again, until 3 p.m. Uh, please go ahead and mark that on your calendars. The email blast with the registration link will be going out next week. Um, and again, this was a fantastic discussion and presentation. I want to thank our Philadelphia Eagles uh, from the bottom of my heart for spending uh, so much time and putting the content together and then also doing such a great job today for us. Um, if you uh, do want to share this with anybody on campus to help reinforce kind of what you're trying to do, then also look for a link to the recording. Uh, in the next couple of days. I make a commitment to get that up on the YouTube channel, hopefully by Friday. Uh, So again, email me with questions if you need anything and have a wonderful rest of the semester. Thank you, Devin. Thank you, Katie. Y'all have a great rest of the week. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.